Welcome to Lunch of the Lord. I'm Pastor Mark. We're in Ezra chapter 7. We're going to be starting verse 16 this lesson. But before we begin, our theme verse for Lunch of the Lord, Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Now, as we see here, in chap uh, chapter 7 and verses 16 to 18, remember, in verse, uh, actually, chapter 7, verse 14 and 15, it says, For as much as you are sent of the king and of his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem, according to the law of, the, of thy God, which is in thine hand, and to carry the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered. Freely offered. So the king and his seven counselors are making a special offering to the God of Israel. And, and they want Ezra and these about 2,000 people to carry this offering down to Jerusalem. Now... Verse, uh, verses 16 to 18, it says here, And all the silver and gold that you can find in all the province of Babylon with the free will offering of the people and of the priests offering willingly for the house of their God, which is in Jerusalem, that you may buy speedily with this money bullocks, rams, lambs, with their meat offerings and their drink offerings and offer them upon the altar of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. And whatsoever shall seem good to thee and to your brethren to do with the rest of the silver and the gold that that do after the will of your God. So now in verse 16, Ezra is to take the silver and the gold of the king's offering and also all the silver and the gold that would be freely given by those who live in, ba in the Babylonian province and also free will offerings of the people and the priests who live in Babylon. So you have to picture it this way. Here's Ezra and he has approximately 2,000 people that are going to travel with him down to Jerusalem. It's a four-month journey. The people, the Jewish people, the priests and the Levites who want, don't want to make the journey and they want to stay in Babylon, they are sending an, a free will offering with these people down to Jerusalem. And the king also and his seven counselors, they're making an offering to, to God. And they want the, <laughs> the 2,000 people to carry their offering also down to Jerusalem. So now verse 17 says that you may buy speedily with this money bullocks, rams, lambs, and their meat offerings, drink offerings, and offer them upon the altar of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. So with all of these gifts that they're being given, these offerings, uh, Ezra is to buy everything that's needed for the sacrifices and for the different offerings. So they're to take these gifts and uh, use those gifts to buy the animals for sacrifices they need and whatever they need to offer unto God, uh, uh, different things, they are to use these offerings to buy what they need to serve God. Verse 18, And whatsoever shall seem good to you and to your brethren to do with the rest of the silver and the gold, that do after the will of your God. So what they're saying in verse 18 is, if there's any money left over, then you, you use that money only according to the will of your God, right? They were to buy. Uh, they were to buy any other any other necessary things that they needed uh, for the worship of God. But they were to only do it as God wills it. 
right? He says here in the last part of verse 18, that do after the will of your God. Only do it as your God appoints it. Don't do it under your own, you know, don't, you know, don't take the money and go out and, you know, go to the movies or something. <laughs> they didn't have movies back then. But, you know, don't spend it on selfish things. It's to be used for the service of God. So the extra silver and gold was not to be used, again, for any, any self-interest of their own. You know, in these verses, in verses 16 to 18, we see we see a Gentile king, listen, a Gentile king showing more interest and more enthusiasm in the worship of God than many of the Jews back, back then at that time. And many and in many Christians today. Isn't it true? Here's King Artaxerxes. And he's showing more interest and more enthusiasm in the worship of God than many people today who call themselves Christians. And, and he, I mean, he's, the king is making this offering. And, and, and more than likely, King Ahasuerus doesn't, doesn't uh, worship God. He's a, he's a polytheist. He worships many gods. So, you know, he didn't convert to Judaism. He's, that's, this is not the case. So you have this Gentile, in a sense, unsaved Gentile who's showing more enthusiasm towards the worship of God than many Christians today do. His sole concern was the worship of God. Nothing else. Not the walls of Jerusalem or people's houses or bridges, or any other thing, gates or anything in that city of Jerusalem. His soul, his soul concern was the worship of God. And you know, that speaks to us today. What is our soul concern? Is our soul concern the worship of God? Or is our soul concern uh, uh, beautifying a, a building, a thing of concrete or wood, right? Is it, is it, what is our soul concern? What the color, what the color of the, the hallway in the church should be, right? What, what, you know, uh, our soul concern should be the worship of God. Not, not, not the little detailed things. Yes, they'll come in. They'll come in their time and, and, and God will lead us in those, in those things. But our hearts, our hearts' main, main uh, desire should be the worship of God. I mean, this, in a sense, this king has years, puts many Christians to shame. It really does. Verse 19, the vessels also that are given thee for the service of the house of thy God, those deliver thou before the, the God of Jerusalem. So, the vessels here that are spoken of do not seem to be sacred vessels that once belonged to Solomon's temple. Remember, when King Nebuchadnezzar, about 150 years before, when King Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem and, and took, over the, took over the city, and he carried all the people and carried all the gold and the silver out of the temple and took it to Babylon, this, uh, this here, these uh, sacred vessels that he's talking of here do not seem to be these vessels here, right? The, the vessels that were, the vessels that were, the holy vessels from Solomon's temple uh, were probably, were given back when Zerubbabel left and went to uh, Jerusalem uh, earlier, all right? So that's when those, that's when the holy vessels of God left Babylon and went back to Jerusalem. But now uh, these vessels are probably vessels donated by people or by the king himself. Now, verse 20 says, and whatsoever more shall be needful for the house of your God, 
which you have which you shall have occasion to bestow bestow it out of the king's treasure house so the king now gives Ezra permission to draw any more money needed for the house of God and for any of the sacrifices and the offerings. So he's given Ezra permission to use some of the king's money to buy what's needed for the worship of God. And it says here in uh, verse 20, it says the king's, uh, the king's treasure house, all right? The king's treasure house. Now, as we see in verse 21, right? We're gonna see in verse 21 that if Ezra needs any more money, it will not come from the main treasury of the king at Susa, but from the local treasuries, which are beyond the river, all right? Beyond the river. Now, the river, again, spoken of here is probably the Euphrates River, not the Jordan River. So whenever you see in the book of Ezra, when it says beyond the river, it's talking about the Euphrates River, not the Jordan River. Now, verses 21 and 22, and it says, And I, even I, Artaxerxes, the king, do make a decree to all the treasures which are beyond the river. Remember, that's the Euphrates. And that whatsoever Ezra, the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, shall require of you, it be done speedily. Unto an hundred talents of silver, and to an hundred measures of wheat, and to an hundred baths of wine, and to a hundred baths of oil and salt without prescribing how much. Now, we see that there is a limit on some of the items that the king describes here. The king is not giving Ezra unlimited supplies. Now, except for the silver, the land of Palestine had plenty of the rest for their own supply. Now, according to Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 13, salt was very important for the sacrifices, okay? Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13 says, and every oblation of your, of your son with, I'm sorry, every, every oblation of thy meat offering shall, shall you season with salt neither shall you suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering with all thine offerings, you shall offer salt. So salt was absolutely necessary in the offerings given unto God. It was, it was important to be used in the sacrifices. God said so, all right? And verse 23, we'll finish this lesson in verse 23. And it says, Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? So it says, he says here, let it be done diligently. Now, it's interesting how that sometimes the unsaved have more respect and they are more eager towards God than when, when their hearts are moved to than, than the saved, right? God was moving upon King Ahasuerus's heart to allow these Jews to go back and he's sending an offering there. And it's interesting how, again, how, how sometimes Unsaved people can have more respect towards God than some saved people do. They have more eagerness and a more desire to serve God or, or to see God serve. You know, I mean, sometimes sometimes there's people that, you know, go to churches and, and they have a respect towards God and they give mo more money to the church than saved people do. Not because they have more, but because they have a level of respect 
And in a sense, you may say, yeah, but aren't they, in a sense, when they're giving the money, aren't they <laughs> hoping that God would bless them or would, you know, look kindly towards them? Yeah, I, I, I guess that's true, you know. Uh, when an unsaved person goes to a church and maybe gives money, maybe they're hoping that, you know, this God, if he's real, will, you know, look, look happily upon them or something like that. But still, you know, uh, this does not mean that, that they believe in God or that they want to serve God. But if he does exist, they want to be on the right side of God. So this is kind of what King Ahasuerus here is doing. He wants, again, these kings, uh, when they, these Persian kings, when they conquered a land, they would still allow you to worship your own God, even though they conquered you, because they, they would want you, they would want to be on the right side of your God. And they would want any blessings from your God that they can get. Now, as Christians and as God's children and, and servants, shouldn't we be diligent to serve God in the details that God has laid down? Right. Shouldn't we be diligent to serve God in the details? Remember, God is a God is a detailed God. And we should be we should be interested in the details of God's word. It says in Deuteronomy 32, verses 46 and 47. And he said unto them, Set your heart unto all the unto all the words which I testify among you this day which you shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law, for it is not a vain thing for you, because it is your life. And through this thing you shall prolong your days in the land, whither you go over Jordan to possess it. Right? What does he say? He says here, uh, set your heart unto all the words. What? What? Unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which you shall do what? Which you shall command your children to observe to do all the words of the law. Not some of the words, all the words of the law. Why? Verse 47. For it is not a vain thing for you. It's not empty and worthless. It's not empty and worthless. To obey the word of God, to know the word of God, to meditate upon the word of God. It's not empty and worthless, right? Uh, because it is your life. Listen, this, the word of God should be our life. It should be our life. For it is your life. And through this thing, what, through what thing? Through the meditation on the word of God. Through putting the word of God as a priority in our heart. And through this thing, he shall prolong your days in the land, whither you go over Jordan to possess it. Right? It's not empty and worthless to know God's word in details and to teach it to our children. Why? Because it's our life. This, it, the word of God, the word of God is like water. We need water to live, right? We need food to eat. We need air to breathe. The word of God is these things. And because we do it as Christians, the promised blessings from God will be for us as long as God has us on the earth. Right? As long as God has us on the earth, as long as we meditate on the word of God in these days, God promises us blessings for as long as he as long as he has us here whether it's another day or two or a week or whether it's years on end God's promised us blessings but the blessings come as we as we what set our hearts on the word of God we are to study and to obey God's words it is for everyday life 
It's for everyday life. And, and as, as Ezra was sent to, to Jerusalem to, to reform the people and to teach them God's word, because it's all about the word of God. Our life is to be centered on this word of God, to be lived by the word. We are to be people of the word of God in obedience, praying and meditating and studying the word. All right, we're going to start verse 24 next lesson. But until then, walk with the Lord. I know he walks with you.